I would invite you this evening to turn to the Psalms. Uh, We are getting started here in our study of the Psalms. We've looked at two of them so far, and tonight we find ourselves in Psalm 3. Have you ever felt hopeless? Hemmed in by impossible circumstances? Have you felt the rising tide of troubled waters circling your life with no apparent way out? Psalm 3 depicts just such a situation. It's a real song written by a real guy in a very real situation. And it was placed in our Bibles to be sung by God's people. Not everyone will affiliate themselves with the situation described. But at some point, you are going to need a psalm like Psalm 3. Let's read it together. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Yahweh, how my adversaries have become many. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no salvation for him in God. But you, O Yahweh, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I was calling to Yahweh with my voice. He answers me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for Yahweh sustains me. I do not fear ten thousands of people who all around have set themselves against me. Arise, O Yahweh, save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheek. You shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. Your blessing be upon your people. We read in this psalm David's song. David, the shepherd turned king, also songwriter. And this song provides for us a template for trusting God in dire circumstances. We'll outline this psalm with three simple words. We'll see a problem, a solution, and a petition. There's a problem presented in the psalm. There is the solution in the middle stanza of the psalm. And then there is a petition, a prayer, request at the end. The ascription at the beginning, it it sort of looks like a title. Sometimes you see words in your Bible that have been added by the editors. Uh, These are not added words. These are inscripturated words. These words are God-breathed. This is part of the text that reads, A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. It tells us who wrote it. It tells us when, under what circumstances. Fourteen of the Psalms give us the historical situation. This is one of them. Again, all of the songs are collected in the songbook of Israel to be sung by the general population. They all have an author and an origin and a situational setting, and and we're aware of some of those original situations. We're aware of this one. David wrote this song when he fled from Absalom, his son. We pick up the story there in 2 Samuel. It's worth reading 2 Samuel 11 to 19, which we will not do this evening. I'll summarize the highlights for you. 2 Samuel 11 describes Israel at the apex of David's reign. These are sort of the glory days of David. He has solidified power. He's on the throne in Jerusalem. There is peace. The enemies outside are being subdued. Everybody's in line. Tributes coming into the nation. There is prosperity. Things are going well. In 2 Samuel 11, David sinned with Bathsheba and to cover it up had her husband murdered. David in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel is confronted by the prophet Nathan. And then in 2 Samuel 12, 9, we learn that the consequence to David's sin would be severe to his family and to his nation. And those consequences take us at least through chapter 19 of 2 Samuel and really through the whole rest of Old Testament history. In chapter 15 of 2 Samuel, we... We discover the treason and treachery of Absalom. 
Absalom was David's son. He was tall, good-looking, popular. He was motivated by personal ambition. He was not content to be the son of a king. He wanted to be king. He executed with skill his plan. He sowed doubt and discord, and with his schemes, he purchased loyalty to himself. And I want you to turn to 2 Samuel 15. And get a flavor of the effects of Absalom's treason. In verse 10, we read, Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom is king in Hebron. That's about 17 miles outside of Jerusalem, the center of the conspiracy. Look at verse 12. Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor from his city in Gilo, and while he was offering sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. Look at verse 13. An informant came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have followed Absalom. Verse 14 tells us, David said to his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, for otherwise there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go in haste, lest he overtake us hastily and drive calamity on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. David has to flee the city, abdicate the throne, and go in exile. Look at verse 30. David went up, the ascent of the Mount of Olives. On his way out of Jerusalem, he climbs this hill. He wept as he went. His head was covered and he was walking barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered his head and went up weeping. When you get to chapter 16, beginning in verse 5, we discover Shimei. And Shimei is cursing the king. He's walking alongside of David and the small entourage fleeing Jerusalem. And and he is hurling curses at the king. and, And not just throwing words, he's also throwing rocks. And one of David's swordsmen says, do you want me to dispatch him for you? It would be easy to cut off the head of this dog. And David's response was, if God wants him to curse the king, let him curse the king. It's a stunning scene. Chapter 17, verse 22, David and those loyal to him crossed the Jordan River to camp there. The conspiracy has been successful. David has been betrayed by his wayward, godless, treasonous, treacherous son. He is exiled from his own home and his throne, and he is away from the temple presence of God. And if you think about the promises of God from Genesis 12 and the Abrahamic covenant, where Israel is promised a people, a land, and a blessing. And then the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, where that would come through the line of Judah and specifically through the house of David. And there would be peace and a throne that is established forever. All of this is the undoing. David is leaving Jerusalem, leaving the presence of Yahweh where he set his ark of his presence and his affections on this mountain He walks over the Mount of Olives and crosses the Jordan. It's like the undoing of the Exodus, uh, Exodus from Egypt. It's the undoing of the promises into the promised land. It's the undoing of the blessings. It's the undoing of the dynasty. It all seems to be going backwards. When you get to chapter 18, we discover that Absalom is dead and David is mourning him. David loved Absalom. Absalom did not love his father. This was a personal crisis for David. It was a national crisis for the nation. It was a family crisis for David as a father. It was a political crisis for the kingdom. It is also a redemptive historical crisis for the plan of God, for the people of God. God has made promises and his integrity is staked upon those promises and they seem to all be falling apart. I don't know what you can relate to in this story or what you may be able to relate to at some point in your life. It's not likely that you will be a monarch over a world power. You can take comfort in that. You're also not a placeholder for God's covenant promises to the nation of Israel and to the world. 
But you might one day be surrounded by a rising tide of trials and troubles, which will not be relieved by your own resources. You might have a wayward son or a daughter that breaks your heart, spurns your love, wants your stuff but doesn't want you, refuses wisdom, wastes his life, rejects God, and rejects the family. I can think of no greater heartache in this life than a wayward child. You can probably relate to being a sinner before God and wondering if God will refuse to be your help in life's difficulties because of your sin. And perhaps you've felt that way already. Let me give you the punchline of this psalm up front. God is unflinching in His covenant faithfulness. What He has promised, He will do. He has promised to be a help to His people. You can bank on it. He is a good father to those he loves. His love is infinite, unchanging. It is secured by the blood of his own unique son. And all of this gives us a foundation for trusting him in dark days. Whatever our difficult circumstances, you and I are going to need this song. So we'll look this evening at a song that is a template for trusting God in dire circumstances. We'll look at the problem, the solution, and then the petition. First, the problem. This is in the first two verses. After the description of the setting, David says, O Yahweh, how my adversaries have become many. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no salvation for him in God. Many, many, many. Three times over in these first two verses. And the word many is actually repeated down in verse 6. You don't see it in English, but the word ten thousands is actually built off the Hebrew word for many. So you see this over and over again in this chapter. David says, my adversaries increased, past tense, and the numbers are still rising. Ongoing tense. It's like a tidal surge in a Category 5 hurricane. The eye wall has made a bullseye for your city, which sits below sea level. It's high tide and the full moon when the high tides are maximized. The water is already flooding your home, and it's getting higher and higher. You don't know how high it will go, and you've only experienced so far the outer bands of the storm. The eye wall is coming. David says... Oh, how my enemies increased. The conspiracy against him is growing in the nation. The tides of popular opinion and loyalty have gone to Absalom instead of David. David does not know how far it will go. David recognizes his enemies have increased. David's enemies are not those external enemies he had faced before. Lions and tigers and bears... Not Philistine giants, not the Edomites, the Ammonites, or the Moabites. Now the enemies are men like his trusted counselor, Ahithophel. His soldiers, their commanders, the general populace, and his very own son. In verse 2, he says, many are saying. There is a military threat in this Song, but there is also a verbal assault. Literally, the text reads, Many are saying, To my soul. That is, these words are piercing, they are cutting words. If you've been in Arizona long, perhaps you've been hiking on a trail. Maybe you've encountered the Choya cactus. It's also known as the jumping cactus. Because if you were to put the needles of the Choya cactus, which look like a teddy bear, fuzzy and soft, if you look at the needles up close, they have very fine barbs, and, and the tip of the needle is so small as to be imperceptible to the eye. So before you even touch it, it's touching you, and the barbs draw it deeper and deeper into the skin. And the more you wiggle and the more you try to get it out, the more it draws itself in. The words of David's assailants are like those barbs. They, they drive into the soul. They are piercing and cutting these verbal assaults get to the very soul of the psalmist. And what do they say? There is no salvation for him in God. 
And this verbal attack hits home. David feels this one profoundly because of his own personal life. And I believe he also feels it for the honor and integrity of God and God's promises. What is their claim? God can't rescue David. God won't rescue David. God has abandoned David. And maybe some of them make the claim this way, Yahweh is no true God, or Yahweh is not good. All of this hits home for David because God is discredited, and it hits home for David because David's relationship to God is discredited. There's no salvation for, for him in God. And by the way, they're not using the personal name of God. It is the, the word Elohim. It is the generic title for God or any God. And the statement is, God is no help, or, or perhaps their statement is, God won't help you. And who would be saying such things? Well, of course, the enemies would say this with a triumphant boast. Uh, David's enemies might say, God is on our side, not on David's side. And the enemies who wanted their antagonism to David to be vindicated by the outcome of their treachery. See, if we win, it proves God's not with David. I think others could be making this statement. Friends of David who were dismayed, their faith faltered. Maybe God isn't with David. Look how bad things are going. I think David's own heart could say this, perhaps. Consider David's sin with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah. This would be thrown back at David's soul like the sharp barb of a tinged conscience. This would be thrown back at David by the, the enemies of David's soul, by the accuser of the brethren, and by David's own smitten heart. But I want you to remember that after David's sin with Bathsheba, after he was confronted by Nathan the prophet, David confessed, and he confessed his sin humbly, sorrowfully before the Lord. And the Lord himself, through David, affirmed, or through Nathan, affirmed David's forgiveness. And you can read about David's heart in his confession and his assurance of God's love and forgiveness in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. We'll, we'll get to those eventually on Sunday nights, Lord willing. So you need to know that as it relates to David's sins, which are so prominent in the narrative of 2 Samuel, they were covered as far as God is concerned. They were paid for. David stood on good ground with God, not on the basis of deeds done in the body, but on the basis of faith in God's provision of cleansing and pardon, all of grace. So David's situation looks like divine vis disfavor. So haters and friends and, and David's own soul at times may be saying, God's not helping you. Spurgeon remarking on this word says, if all the trials which come from heaven, of all the temptations which ascend from hell, all the crosses that arise from the earth, if they all could be mixed and pressed together, they would not make a trial so terrible as that which is contained in this verse. It is the most bitter of all afflictions to be led to fear that there is no help for us in God. And I think Spurgeon is right. Is there anything worse than being in such a low point as to think, God can't help me. That is what the enemies of David claim here. I want you to notice the last word of verse 2. Do you see it? It's a Hebrew word. Selah. It's, it's untranslated. You don't get an English word in place of the Hebrew word. The, the, the Bible Printers just put the Hebrew word right in there, Selah. What is that? It's just sitting there by itself. This is our first encounter of Selah in the Psalms, so we need to take a little bit of time to introduce ourselves to the Selah. It is likely a musical term, giving musical instruction. It is of unknown derivation. Some scholars point to a similar word with, with one letter difference that means to lift up. And so they say it must come from that word that, that seems really close. That would indicate maybe a crescendo, increase the volume, add more instruments, add vocal harmonies. 
The Selah occurs 71 times in the Psalms, three times in Habakkuk chapter 3, and three times in this Psalm alone. And in all of those contexts, the crescendo idea, lifting up the music some more, doesn't seem to fit. Most scholars today, and I believe this is the correct view, see the Selah as instruction for a musical interlude. Not a building up of the volume, but let the instruments play while we pause the words. The instruments continue playing while the worshipers have time to contemplate what has just been sung, to think about the words, to ruminate on them, to meditate. But the meditation here isn't individual, it's collective. We do it together while the instruments continue. Selah is the Hebrew word for guitar solo. Not really, that's not what the Hebrew means. And lest you be confused by what I mean by that, I don't mean the ear-piercing, light-speed showmanship designed to bring glory to a long-haired, face-painted, grandstanding glamster. What I mean here is wordless chords and notes that fit the setting, that lend themselves meditatively as a musical background for thoughtful contemplation of the lyrics just uttered. That's a Selah. It's actually an instruction given in the song. It's a pause. But it's not a silent pause. The musical interlude keeps the congregation on topic. It, it keeps us together in the situation. We stop singing for a moment, but we haven't left the song. We stay in it together. Our lips stop moving, but our hearts still soar collectively heavenward. There is a theology to the musical interlude. In our corporate singing, a, a piano intro, Matt York painting melodic pictures between verses, a key change, a cello solo, instruments drop out, instruments enter back in and build volume, a, a violin outro. These are artistic musical features that complement and serve the lyrics, and they're commanded right here in the psalm. So what should you be doing during a Selah? When Chris is leading us and we stop singing and instruments are going, tune out, think about lunch, think of something else, admire the musicianship. Those are not the goals, the purpose and, and what we should be doing in those moments is letting our minds soak in the truths we just sang before, before we move on so quickly to the next line of words. And in this Selah, in this verse, in this psalm, what did the guitar solo leave us to contemplate? A rising tide of enemies saying, God's not going to help David. We pause. We pause the song. We pause our singing the song and, and we meditate on that for a little while. The instruments keep us in the situation. Maybe we think about our own situations before we move on. This is helpful. We're not leaving the problem too quickly, but we must move on. And that leads to the solution. Beginning in verse 3. But you, O Yahweh, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I was calling to Yahweh with my voice, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for Yahweh sustains me. I do not fear ten thousands of people who all around have set themselves against me. David moves here from the problem to the solution. And verse 3 gives us a strong con uh, contrast. But you, O Yahweh, there is an attention-getting conjunction. The but at the beginning of the verse is, is, is there on purpose and it stands out in this psalm. And then there is an emphatic pronoun in Hebrew. It is you, Yahweh. You, Yahweh. And, and this gets our eyes off the problem and our eyes up to God. This is so helpful. And David utters Yahweh's name, his personal name. The name which designates his own self-existence and his covenant-keeping nature. He is the God who exists all by himself, and he is the God who loves his people, makes promises, and keeps them. <laughs> 
And notice what he affirms about Yahweh. Here we just have systematic theology rolling out in song. You, O Yahweh, are a shield about me. And the shield in ancient Near Eastern warfare was typically a a, a thick leather disc held at at arm's length to, to stop things and to blunt blows. But the shield described here is is not this little leather disc out front, skillfully wielded wherever the threat was coming from. No, this is a surrounding me on all sides kind of shield. A protection on all sides, every side, all about. David says, you, O Yahweh, are a shield round about me, and you are my glory. If you were to ask yourself, what is David famous for? What's on his resume? Uh, You would say, well, he was a nobody shepherd that became Israel's king. He was the monarch of a world power. He was a songwriter. Goliath's sword is on his mantle. The young ladies of the country sang the top 40 song. He killed his tens of thousands. He was a skilled administrator, a brave warrior, a prophet. And his name was a placeholder for the covenant promise of God. It is the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. He was also known as the man after God's own heart. And and perhaps what David did here in this verse indicates some of that heart. What did David say was the best thing about him? He didn't list his pedigree or his accomplishments, he didn't boast in his achievements. He said, my glory is Yahweh. What's the most important thing about me? Not my reputation, my abilities, or the things I've done, but God. Oh, Yahweh, you are a shield about me, and you are my glory. Not his kingdom, not his dynasty, not all the the, the things he misses being in the temple, but God. And he says, you are the lifter of my head. You can picture the head bowed low as David leaves Jerusalem and the royal complex barefoot, weeping, discouraged. You think of a sad, disheartened child when a compassionate mother puts her tender hand under the chin and lifts the head so that her reassuring eyes can captivate the broken-hearted child. That's a good picture of being a lifter of the head. There, there is probably more here in David's situation. In Genesis 40, verse 13, Joseph interpreted a dream for a cupbearer who lost his place before the king. And and Joseph said that God had revealed in the dream that the cupbearer, that Pharaoh will lift up your head. And and what was meant by that is a return to his exalted position, his place of prominence in the royal court. And David here may be expressing a confidence in what God had promised concerning, concerning his covenant with David and the throne and the dynasty. And the point of this in verse 3 is a contrast to the many in verse 2. Many are saying of my soul, there's no salvation in God. But you, O Yahweh, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one lifting my head. God is a help to David. And David affirms that. Look at verse 4. David says, I cry to Yahweh with my voice. And he answers. Uh, These should probably not be translated in a past tense. Uh, These are uh, sort of ongoing tense forms in Hebrew. And the the changes between verb forms is pretty important here. We should read verse 4 with the idea of, I cry with my voice. Not a completed action, but something that continues. God answers from his holy mountain. Again, a continual sort of thing. And when you get to verse 5, I slept. I awoke. And then you get to verse 6, more continual actions, so I don't fear. I go on not fearing. So when David says in verse 4, with my voice I cry out, this isn't a one-time thing. It's not a finished deal. This is a pattern in David's life. 
And the word voice is at the very front of the verse. It, it's emphatic. And, and, and sometimes perhaps you have prayed out loud. Many times we pray silently and no one else can hear. And there are times of urgent, serious prayer where you say, Oh my God, you cry out out loud. That's David here. The enemies are saying things. Now David says things. David speaks and he pours out his heart to God. One Old Testament scholar said, too often plans come before prayers. David here prays. And he affirms God answers. He answers me from his holy mountain. That is, God loves. He is attentive. Let a forgiven child of God never doubt God's attentive ear to humble supplication. David cries out with his voice and God answers. And he answers, according to verse 4, from his holy mountain. This is important to David. David's left the royal complex and the temple where the ark of God's presence was in the Old Testament. God manifested his presence in real, tangible ways in the temple. David's out. He's exiled. He's even across the Jordan River out camping in the wilderness. And he affirms God hears him there. And answers from his holy mountain. David remembered where God had set his affections and located his promises for his people. One could wonder, does God hear? And David affirms, God answers. And notice the end of verse 4, we, we have that word again, Selah. This is a musical interlude. Strike up the instruments, let them play, and let us sit in this thought for a few moments before we move on. What is the thought? We cry out, and God hears. I should have had Chris Allen come and play one of those buttery, meditative solos while we just think, I cry out, God answers. I cry out, God answers. And we just echo that refrain in our hearts. Look at verse 5. We pick up the song again. The verbs change. Now instead of ongoing continual actions, we have this statement. I lay down and I slept. And I woke up. The reason, the basis of all of this is found in the second half of verse 5. For Yahweh sustains me. Not just one time, but in a continual way. But this allowed David in his dark days when he is surrounded by enemies to sleep. This is strange. He goes on in verse 6 to say, I do not fear. Or perhaps you could translate it, I will not fear. Ten thousands of people who all around have set themselves against me. Literally, they have established their surroundings upon me. And David here is not being metaphorical or poetic or hyperbolic. He's not talking hypotheticals or potential dangers. He is being deadly, seriously literal. He's in the wilderness, fleeing from enemies who have surrounded him by their armies, led by his treasonous son. And David slept. You might expect a sleepless night on military alert, utmost vigilance. When you're surrounded by people that want to kill you, you probably would not enjoy restful slumber. I did when I was a kid at Silver Salmon Creek. We were camping there as a family, surrounded by grizzly bears who tore through our camping stuff and ate our food. They destroyed our coolers and ate all the fish we had caught that day. We got in the tent that night after a warning from my dad that said, no candy bars in your pockets, nothing that smells like food anywhere near you. The bear will go through you to get the Snickers bar. Okay. <laughs> Emptied the pockets. Went to sleep. My parents didn't sleep. My dad clutched his 12 gauge and his 44 Magnum, and my mom clutched my dad. But my sister and I, we zonked out. We slept like, like babies. David slept while a hostile army surrounded the camp. How could he do that? 
David's slumber was not the sleep of indifference or carelessness or presumption. David's rest was the sleep of faith, of trust. One scholar said, faith marks the difference between despair and hope. And I would suggest to you that faith is only as good as its object. And David trusted Yahweh, the Lord of armies. David's faith here reveals his submission to God's sovereign goodness. He has cast his cares upon the Lord, and the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, is guarding his heart. And he sleeps. Reminds me of Psalm 121. God doesn't sleep, so his people can. God's up all night worrying about stuff I don't have to be. That's David's perspective here. Sometimes sleepless nights reveal that my heart has not fully cast its burdens onto the Lord. Sometimes a sleepless night just means you drank coffee too late in the day. But sometimes we're sleepless because we haven't done all the work of casting our cares. Charles Spurgeon said, We need not fear a frowning world while we rejoice in a prayer hearing God. And it's interesting that David's confidence rests in the promises of God, not in David's own personal performance. This is the sleep of faith, not the sleep of merit. David knows, despite what his enemies claim, that there is indeed salvation in God. God alone. And God hears. So finally in the psalm, we arrive at the content of David's prayer to God. This is part three, the petition. It's in verses seven and eight. Arise, O Yahweh, David cries. Save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheek. You shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. Your blessing be upon your people. You need to understand that David in this setting is not suffering anything he doesn't deserve. In his darkest days, David is not getting what he deserves. His plea is not based on deserts. David's focus is on God, God's person, his plan, his promises, his mercy, his compassion, his kindness. God is not obligated to help any sinner. But God has set his affections on David and made promises to David, and that is what David has confidence in. You and I get tripped up when we think that God will answer our prayers because we merited answers. That is not biblical thinking at all. Look what David prays. Arise, O Yahweh. Arise in verse 7. That's a contrast to the rising tide of enemies in verse 1. Same word. This arise, O Yahweh, probably was a battle cry for Israel's army. Beginning back in Numbers chapter 10, Moses went out with the ark before the people. The first time they sort of take the ark out before the enemies of God. And Moses called out, arise, O Yahweh, scatter the enemies who hate you. And many scholars believe that this was the battle cry for Israel as they took the ark of the presence of Yahweh out before the enemy armies. David here echoes that battle cry. And he says, save me, O oh my God. And the word save here in this prayer, all the elements of this prayer hearken back to the problem in verse 1. Enemies are rising. God, you arise. Nobody can save God. God's not going to save David. David says, save me, O oh my God. And what's interesting, they use the generic title for God in their complaint against David. And when David re-echoes their words, their complaint, he adds something. Do you see that? It's not a generic title. It comes with a possessive personal pronoun. Save me, my God. This is akin to crying out, my father. This is a personal relationship. David owns Yahweh in the sense of Yahweh is David's only God. And David has nowhere else to turn but Yahweh. And David is confident of Yahweh's filial relationship or father-son relationship to him. And Yahweh owns David. 
David is affirming here that salvation is only in God, only in the God of Israel, only in Yahweh. And then he says, you struck all my enemies on the cheek. And the word for enemies here in Hebrew is literally my haters. You struck my haters on the cheek. What does it mean to strike somebody on the cheek? It was a sign of ultimate humiliation. And there's a parallel statement here. You shattered the teeth of the wicked. This backhand to the jawbone shattered the teeth of the enemies. In Psalm 58, 6, we read that wild animals defanged are no longer a threat. These ravenous lions that would come against God's people, if God takes the fangs out, uh, the lions don't seem to be hungry anymore. The wild animals debilitated with broken teeth are a picture of what God is doing here for David. Humiliating the enemies and removing their ability to fight against him. If you met a great white shark named Toothless, you might still be scared, but not quite as much. What is he going to do? Gum you to death? The point here is that David's enemies have been debilitated by their teeth being shattered. These are past, past tense verbs. Perhaps David is recounting some past rescue. Or maybe David is already counting the victory, expressing confidence in the present. And the point is that all the military might and all the caustic words hurled at David are no match for Yahweh. Look at verse 8. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. A very simple sentence in the original. Salvation to Yahweh. It's his it belongs to him. Salvation is from him and through him and to him. It could be credited to no other source. As Joel James has written, Yahweh cornered the market on salvation. He owns it. And, and this petition, Yahweh, save me, O my God. It either celebrates that, that God humiliated David's enemies, shattered their teeth, defanged their military and vocal abilities to harangue and harass David. Or it is an embedded plea that God would do those things with the confidence that David has that he would, in fact, do it. These are sometimes strange words to us. We're introduced here in this psalm to the first imprecatory ideas. An imprecation or a, an imprecatory psalm is a, a psalmist writing in hope that God would harm or judge or destroy enemies. Have you ever been troubled by these imprecations in the psalms? Does this seem unchristian? Jesus said, your enemy wants to strike you on the cheek, give him the other one too. Is this some sort of vindictiveness, uh, returning evil for evil? As we see sort of this first expression of an imprecatory idea, the, the, the idea that the psalmist would rejoice in God bringing judgment or harm to an enemy, it's the first of many that we will see in the songbook of Israel, and you need to know what to do with them. I'll tell you what I don't do with them. I don't pray them. <laughs> and the reason I don't pray them is I think they serve a specific purpose in the songbook of Israel, most often tied to David and the Davidic dynasty, and therefore connected to the placeholder of the Davidic covenant. They have more to do with the redemptive historical plan of God and God's integrity in keeping his promises, part of his promises to subdue the enemies of God's grace. And it is a plea from David that, he, that God would do exactly what he promised to do. And that enemies of the Davidic covenant, enemies of the house of David, enemies of the Davidic dynasty, are enemies of the promises of God. They are enemies of the seed line of David, and they are therefore enemies of God's redemptive plan through the greater son of David, namely Jesus. I think these imprecatory psalms have far less to do with us than might appear at first reading. I wouldn't encourage you to use them as prayers for some sort of vindictiveness against your personal enemies. 
but we do align our hearts with the plan and purposes of God, which are good all the time. And if God has set his heart and his plan to ruin his enemies, what must we say? God, to you alone be the glory. Do as you will. I was an enemy and I've been made your friend. Oh, thank you. I think that's how we should respond to these things. When we get to Revelation, we will see there is a time where the saints in heaven actually call down God's judgment on their fellow earth dwellers who do not repent. There's a time and a place for that. The time and place here makes perfect sense in this setting when the Davidic dynasty is threatened, the Messiah's seed line is on the line. And a usurper is on the throne that God promised to David and his house. These are not vindictiveness. These are the defense of God's glory and integrity. Notice the last line of the song. Your blessing be upon your people. David is thinking about others in his dark day. And think about who he's thinking about. He doesn't say, my people, my citizens, my subjects, get them back here, kill all the disloyals, make a new nation for me. David says, God, may your blessing be upon your people. The ownership of the people is God's. David humbly acknowledges that here, and he intercedes for them he doesn't call a curse upon the nation for following Absalom's conspiracy in mass. He calls God to bless them. It's stunning. This humble faith is concerned for others, it's concerned for the nation, it's concerned for the covenant. And the psalm closes with another Selah. An extended musical outro to help us ponder what we have just sung. While David has ended his song... I'm not quite ready to end it. Sometimes you get to the end of the verse, you think, Whew, now we can go to get dessert. He's going to close in prayer. Fair warning. I'm going to talk for just a couple more minutes. I want to read to you the Hebrew word for salvation in verse 8. Yeshua. Yeshua is the word for salvation in verse 8. Who is it who takes that name? Someone else walked out of Jerusalem, burdened with sorrows. He walked up the Mount of Olives, betrayed, surrounded by enemies, abandoned by friends, and alone. How alone was David? Kind of, sort of, but not absolutely. You read 2 Samuel... He had friends. He had people that loved him, met his needs, stayed faithful to him. How alone was the son of David when he was surrounded by enemies? Against him were Satan and the demons, Judas, the insider, the Romans, the Jews, the government, the populace, my own sins. He was absolutely alone. When he, that is Jesus, walked out of Jerusalem, betrayed, abandoned, burdened, he met his darkest hours with no sin of his own. He was not getting what he deserved, and he had no one to help, not even God. Even his father turned away his face. Why did Jesus march up a hill outside of Jerusalem? To pay for our sin. Only Jesus could do it. Only the God-man could take in his infinite person our sins and offenses against the holy justice of his father. Only he could fill up the cup of the Father's wrath to overflowing and absorb all of it down to the dregs so no wrath is left and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ by faith. 
Only Jesus could pay for sins. Only the innocent one could take our guilt and set us free. And you and I are victims and perpetrators of animosity towards God by nature. We were born enemies, hostile to Him. And we were surrounded by enemies, hostile to Him. And if you're in Jesus Christ, you know God in His kindness and grace looked down on you at your worst and saved you. And you can say, there is salvation for me in God. And it is in Yeshua, Messiah Jesus, the son of David. And all the way back to Psalm 3, God is preserving that plan to rescue you from your mortal enemies, your sin, and God's justice levied against it. Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And we enter into this grace in which we now stand. And the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And everything's different because of God our Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if there be those here tonight who do not yet know your salvation in your Son Christ, we pray that they would yield, find rest and life, forgiveness of sin, and safety when surrounded by tens of thousands of mortal enemies. All of these things are from you, whose arm cannot be stopped, whose power cannot be thwarted, and whose love can never be severed from those who belong to you. We ask, O oh God, that even tonight you would be the lifter of our heads. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.